and hello everyone. I you know, do drop a one in the chat to let me know that the audio is coming through great. I'm here today and we are bringing the thunder with the one and the only thunderous one. Hey thunderous, how are you doing? Hello. Hey everyone, hope everyone's all right. Hope everyone's having a good weekend. And that um, everyone's in good health. Looking yep. forward to the show. Yeah, glad to have you back. Let me just say hello to Sergeant Grinch, to Sandro, to Irwin. Um, yeah, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, welcome. Logan Silverwolf, what's the topic today? Uh, yeah, we'll find out. Horse, of course. <laughs> Little Lil Main, good afternoon from Canada, she says. Um, Century Since, welcome. Philip, uh, let's see. We've got Michelle, who's busy cooking, apparently. Um, Dr. Obvious, welcome. And... We've got Thunderous One in the chat and Roseanne Rossi. And Thunder, so they see Sergeant Grinch says, Thank you for the Lucifer series. I forwarded them to a friend who had left the Roman Catholic Church. It has opened his eyes and he's considering returning to the Apostolic Church. Thank you and praise God. That, that's, that's interesting news. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me just go to my channel here and bring up some references. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is me. Um, Yep, so guys, I yeah, I've just finished Rise of the Poopacy, as you guys know, which is discussing Martin Luther's uh, incredibly foul language and attraction to um, feces. And of course, I just finished part one. I've just renamed this to Martin Luther, Hitler and Muhammad, a common hatred of Jews. Um, I decided a name that would, would cause maximum controversy might be appropriate. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that it's actually true and uh, yeah so part two will be on Tuesday evening 7 15 my time so yeah thunderous um <clears throat> where have you been the last couple of weeks and and what's on your mind today you know just the usual um, working and um, keeping up with um, regular Bible reading that sort of thing and watching how the world is developing I'm sure everybody that um, is in the uh, chats and is going to be listening to the show later, must be very disturbed with events as they're taking place um, from one week to the next, just when you think you've got to the point in your life where it cannot get any possibly, it cannot get possibly worse, then something happens and, you know, there we are again thinking, you know, sink, the world sinks to a new low level. And I think for the past couple of weeks, um, two things have come up in my mind that I thought they're interesting developments. One is uh, possibly something that we're going to be touching on now, the... Um, the new law that's going to be enacted about hate speech in Scotland that goes live from April the 1st, um, that's quite an interesting development. And obviously, I think, you know, it goes without saying that we mentioned the religion of peace and um, a particularly nasty and gruesome attack that took place in Russia over the weekend with over 130 people death. Yeah, and of course... Um we need to we need to be very concerned because an attack by Muslims is is bound to lead to Islamophobia, and and Islamophobia is bad. I mean, Islamophobia is worse than than, than killing, right? Isn't it so? No, well, the, the interesting thing in, in this is when you look at the Scottish um, implementing of this um, hate speech law, it's it's a very ambiguous, um, if you like there's no defined how do you define hate is one thing so and then so the way I've analyzed it is that um, if you criticize something that in that could also mean hate speech so for instance if you go by the the attack that's taking place in um, in Russia just drawing attention that it was an Islamic attack could be defined as some kind of hate speech we already know that in the workplace or in politics or in the school education system um, in Europe if you mention anything about Islam it's perceived as a form of Islamophobia but now you now you're taking Islamophobia to the next level and you're calling it hate speech and when you start calling it hate speech, and it's one of those sort of like, um, you know, it's a bit like say mental illness. Well, there's so many varieties of mental illness. You can't, you know, if you're using the term mental illness, it's a very vague, wishy-washy kind of term unless you're defining what the illness is. And the same thing with hate, unless you define what hate is. If you're saying mentioning the truth is now hate or stating the obvious is hate or quoting the Quran is hate or identifying an Islamic attack with some kind of... Um, 
scriptural uh, directive inside uh, that's contain contained within the Islamic sources themselves as hate, then we're really treading in a very, very dangerous area with um, with speech. We already know that people have been arrested for um, silently praying outside of um, abortion clinics. We know people yes. have been arrested saying that men can't be pregnant. We know that um, the author Actually, of... Lord in the UK, Lord, there is a woman, there's a lawyer that is being sued right now for saying that only women get periods. Yes. Yeah, the, the, this, this is now hate speech. The, the, the thing of it this way, think of it this way. Right. You have a, a human being born with a penis uh, and goes rapes a human being born with a vagina. Now, the human being born with a penis may identify as her, she, she her, rapes a, a human being born with a vagina. The human being born with the vagina goes to the police and says, I've been raped. That person that's um, rapes, the victim, then says, claims it was a he. That would be de defined as hate speech because you're misgendering, your, you know, your, the, the person that's violated you. You can get up to seven years for um, this kind of hate speech now. The, the, the maximum term is seven years. Yet for rape, you're going to get significantly less now. You, you know, people get two or three years for rape now. They don't get a great deal as far as the prison sentence is concerned. So can you right. imagine the stupidity in all of this, that a woman gets raped by a man who identifies as a woman. She identifies him as a man. That's now considered hate speech because his feelings are hurt. And she can end up in prison for a greater prison sentence, for, for a greater sentence for right. misgendering a human being that raped her. Does, does yeah. that, do you not see where the problems are? It is insanity. And Hall says in anything denigrating Christianity will somehow not be classified as hate speech. Well, it's, it's all des designed to denigrate Christianity. I think I've mentioned this um, several times now. In the beginning, God created the male and female. Well, no, under Darwin or atheism, which is the roots of all of this um, excrement, is no, you, you don't let your penis and your vagina determine what sex you are. You can you can decide what sex you are, not your genitalia or social constructs. And social constructs, as we know, have all been predicated on objective theistic moral values. Yeah. Okay? Then you have things like um, abortion. Well, it's not abortion. It's uh, pro-choice. Well, in, in the book of Psalms, um, David recognizes that the God of the Bible, when he says, you saw the very embryo of me and all, your, and all its parts, um, and all your parts, it's written down, meaning the, the, the biological DNA construct of the, um, the human body. Yet, you see, so that's an attack. And um, you're finding now that, um, well, well, in the Bible, it says, God says, fill the earth and subdue it. But now we're talking about, there's in the language where, um, for instance, I mean, but you, um, look, they're outlawing truth, they're outlawing fact, they're outlawing science. I mean, yes, but here it is, lawyers sued are... after saying only women have periods. Elspeth Duma Wrigley shared gender critical statements. To say only women have periods is a gender critical statement. You're criticizing. And, and I've, I have an interesting question that I've posed and I would, you know, I've, if, 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 if genitals do not define gender, how does cutting them off affirm gender? Well, hang on, look at it another way. When Muslims perform FGM, female genital mutilation, that's considered barbarism. But if you do that on a child under transgender issues, that's called a liberation. I had so exactly the same that, that I had exactly the same question on my YouTube and Twitter. I put those up. That exact question. It's evil and horrendous when Muslims do it, but when when doctors do it for profit on 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 children, yes. it's affirming care. Yes, yes, exactly that. Exactly that. So you, so you can see, and we're not defending FGM with Islam here. We're just using that as a comparison, that the, the duplicitous nature of the media, because the media and reporters should be commenting on this, but they're, they're actually supporting and advocating the mutilation of uh, other human beings. So if you perform a double mastectomy, you know, that, that's a liberation. If you castrate a boy, that's a liberation. They're not mutilations anymore. They're liberations, and you're affirming their identity. They're being liberated um, from, from rationality. They're being liberated from the oppressive 
cis white Christian European Western logical totalitarian imposition of culture. And and systematically, the discipline at the home is being removed. So you have um, you can't discipline your children at home anymore. When I use the term discipline, I think anybody over the age of 45 will probably remember when your dad gave you a thick hair or something like that. Granted, in some households, there was discipline and there was brutality. OK, but in many households, you had um, discipline. Then if you move forward into the school system, you had the cane or the slipper on the backside and such. And that was considered brutality. So that was removed. In effect, what you're doing is you're removing discipline away from children. And you're also removing by by implication an authority a parent has over a child. OK, and what's the, all that's done is it's empowered the child. Um, and now, for well, not now, for about 15 years now, um, in in England, a girl can get pregnant at the age of 13. The school can arrange the abortion for the girl, and the school are under no legal obligation to inform the parents that they've arranged an abortion for the child. That's in the UK, and that's been going on for years. Wow. So, just yeah, by the way, I'm just curious. Let me just mention one fact. I just want to bring up this point. Here, uh, open image in new tab. I don't know if people are aware, but there's not a single white leader now in the UK. Now, that this is Wales. He was elected. This is the president of Wales right now. UK, Scotland, Pakistani, Pakistani, Paki well, Indian, Pakistani, Pakistani, or something like that. Mm. Or India, whatever, Indian, Pakistani. And he's just resigned because he's come under amazing pressure, but there's not a single white leader. In, in, in countries that are in a, in a region that is apparently like 90% white, they've only got black leaders because obviously these are very racist countries. It's shameful that, they, that they're 90% white and they've all elected black leaders due to their racism, which is shocking. But I mean, why would black people who come from cu cultures that are not Western and European have a loyalty to the countries that they are running? <clears throat> well, they wouldn't. These men will be more interested, um, with the exception of maybe Rishi, I think he's probably more loyal to money because he's got enough of it. But the other two yep. characters, you know, if, they're Muslim, if they're Muslim men, then they're going to be loyal to the religion of Islam first. They have to be, because yep. otherwise they're just putting targets on their back from the Muslim community. Well, fair enough. I mean, this so, is disturbing to me. Um, this is very disturbing because... What, what, what's disturbing as well is that if you think about, um, what's it, Yusuf? Uh, Hamza Yusuf, the guy in Scotland. Now, he did a speech, was it about two or three months ago, maybe yeah. even longer? Where, the judges where are white, the a... president is white, the deputy president is white, white. the vice president is white, the head of the courts is white, the, the, the heads yeah. of all the benches are white, all of the heads but, of the departments are white. Like It's a 96% white country, what do you expect? In the, in the, and this is it. And, and so you have to ask ask the question, if you're going to start implementing, and people could be asking in the in the, um, in the comments, well, what's the show about? Well, we're talking about um, um, free speech in Scotland. So you could ask the question, well, what's that got to do with, you know, with this channel um, per se? But the thing is, what it's got to do with is, is channels like this discuss topics like this. At yeah. some point in the future, you can see that topics like... Um, atheism and the impact of atheism, um, um, LGBTQ and all the other kind of lifestyles, uh, drag queen story time, maps, blah, blah, blah. They will be at some point considered hate speech. Already it's going in a d direction with YouTube. I've had two YouTube cha channels banned of my own are removed. I'm on my third one and I'm having to be careful what I put on there as it is anyway. So you can see that channels will soon be removed Already, I don't know if people have noticed when they're commenting on other people's channels. Have you not noticed that your comments, as soon as you've made it, they're not even actually listed in a comment section? Or if you go back to it later, when somebody's responded, you found that your comments been removed. Yeah, already YouTube does that, that regularly. Kind, yeah, that that kind of censorship is already taking place, and the danger could be now if you're making comments on Islam and they could be considered Islamophobic, and then if they're Islamophobic, then they could be considered hate. The interesting thing is in all of this, it isn't what you say that could be the problem. In this hate speech law with Scotland, it's how the hate is perceived by the recipient. Well, that's you, can be, you can have a conversation in your house privately and someone can report it 
and you can be arrested for that. Anything that yes. you send privately, private conversations, your, the police can come to your door, request to see your electronic media, phones, tablets, computers, yep. emails. And if you've send, sent anything to someone, if you've even sent private emails to your wife, your friends, your son, you can be, you can go to prison for having submitted. I, be, I believe that's that's the law, right? From what I've been watching in the news, is that correct, Andres? You can um, go to prison I'm for sharing material that someone would perceive as yeah. hateful. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And and you can see where these things have started. I would say COVID was almost like um, the main catalyst. And it's, it's been happening before with um, freedom of speech and comments in the, on social media systems. But COVID really brought it out because people, um, uh, whether I'm not going to go into the narrative, whether it was real or not, it's, it's not really relevant to the subject. But the principle is in that um, in the Houses of Parliament, they, they, the question was raised about whether the government should take the lead on censoring what goes on to social media platforms or should the um, social media platforms be given the uh, license? Well, they should be encouraged to monitor what goes on their social platforms. They should self-censor without the government getting involved. And that was with reference to misinformation, disinformation and conspiracy theories about the COVID and the COVID vaccine. So now you're seeing an extension of that or, or it being enforced using people's uh, a bro a broader, a broader subjects like um, the LGBTQ and also with reference to Islam. And I dare say, you know, and what it's leading to could well be at the end of the day, if you're going to end up being critical of the government, would that be something that would be considered misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, or even a conspiracy? So these things are actually dangerous. They're not something that should be ignored. They should be that should be monitored. And the way that I would like to sort of maybe go into it a little bit is, in Canada, they're looking to extend um, euthanasia to people with mental illness. I know I've mentioned this before. However, they don't have the um, assisted suicide program in England. Yeah, some countries in Europe do. I think Switzerland and, Switzerland and Australia, two locations. In this right. country, United Kingdom, they don't. However, one of its one of its famous presenters from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, Esther Ranson, has now been advocating it, particularly in her own case, for assisted suicide. So already this, the topic is being raised in the House of Lords, whether assisted suicide should be allowed in the United Kingdom. And you know as well as I do, and many in the audience will also recognize this, that once you start raising, once you've mentioned the subject, you've basically sort of like opened the subject to other, where do you, if you're gonna say for instance, um, assisted suicide for somebody that's got terminal illness, that's how it starts. Yeah, where well, I mean, the euthanasia like trials, so in Germany, right, there were legal proceedings against the main perpetrators and accomplices of, involved in the euthanasia murder, murders of Nazi-era Germany. <clears throat> it was a crime for the Nazis to do so. Now, today in Canada, it is public health policy. Yeah. The, the, this is the bizarreness of this. So it, it, we're getting to the point now where actually correcting, you know, using correct gender pronouns is now going to be hate speech. Biology, if you use factual biology, double X chromosomes and XY chromosome would be considered hate speech. That's where we're going in all of this. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and I would add on to that. If anybody lives in the United Kingdom, Right. And you're familiar with the type of police that we've got in this country. They're, when I'm a 56 year old man and, um, you know, I was a bit naughty in the 80s and the 90s. I, I had the occasional scrap every now and again. Who didn't? But there, there were rules. And the type of policemen that you had that come and arrest us were normally sort of like ex squaddies or ex military that came out of the military and that went into the police force. So these were disciplined men, strong men, firm, firm but fair men. So they lived a little bit of life. But now what you're getting into the police forces are, um, for instance, um, straight from university or they're, they're, they are filling quotas. They've got to be black. They've got to be brown. They've got to be yellow. They've got to be female. They've got to be um, gendered or whatever in some kind of way. Not, they can't be heterosexual. They've got to be LGBTQ or something. And, they're your, and, and so when you look at, say, the rise in crime in the United Kingdom, knife crime is at epidemic levels, shoplifting, epidemic levels. Theft in general, like burglaries, has started to go up, which, which is um, 
a crime that we saw um, going well, down in this Yeah, country. your police are too busy policing people who say that men They're, can't be women on Twitter. Exactly that. So you're finding that the police force that we've got in this country, one, they're not mentally capable. You wouldn't trust them to go to, say, a gang and make some arrests with people with knives. That's not going to happen because they're not mentally strong enough to do things like that. What, um, there was a famous case in this country last year where a girl with learning difficulties of some sort or another made a comment about a policewoman being, oh, you remind me of my lesbian nanny. That policewoman turned up with about five of the members of the police force to yes, arrest a 16 yes, year right? There you go. And that same woman was then seen about two, two months later sp frantically spraying acid, um, oh, not acid, sorry, I make a retraction, pepper spray, um, on a crowd of people that weren't actually being very aggressive. So the point I'm trying to get at is the police force are more interested, as you've said, to be involved in hate crimes, misgendering, then they are arresting real criminals. Now, yeah, they, um, the they become is, morality police. Basically, you've got yeah, the implementation yeah. of Sharia police. <clears throat> the Mutawa, I think they call the, the morality police, like they have in Saudi Arabia. This is what it's become. They are politically partisan and they are morally partisan. It's replacement morality. And Islam has been incredibly successful at. at infiltrating uh, law enforcement, media, uh, schools, administrations, uh, government, and so on. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And, and as you said, and you, know, you mentioned uh, several weeks ago, a couple of months ago now, about um, how certain people or groups or ideologies within Islam are funded in order to make um, headroom in politics and uh, um the polices and universities to propagate Islam and to create sort of like a, an atmosphere of where being critical of Islam is something that's going to be uh, punishable. And we're very much seeing that. And I think the Scottish law is very much um, an indication of that kind of influence that you covered a couple of months I, ago, Lloyd. Let me show something. We were discussing earlier Islamic Dawah, and they've been incredibly successful. And I wanted to show people this. This is on the Sharia. <clears throat> this is a discussion um, to, to change topics slightly. Replacement morality. Yes, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel. Um, <clears throat> the, this is a book called, this is a thesis on Sharani, Al Sharani, on the Al Mazan Al Kubra, the great balance or the, the supreme scales. Um, so in Islam, they've, they've got four madahib or four schools of jurisprudence that are very similar but also they differ in some cases they might even contradict or they challenge each other's interpretations so this guy had to come along and try to find a way to harmonize all these four schools and he had to create the great balance the four scales right the idea of the great balance also is reminiscent of gnosticism <clears throat> ideas where you've got where where god is a combination of good and evil he's he's got good and evil in perfect balance so god is both good and evil which is not a Christian view, it is the Gnostic view. You can think, think of Star Wars, you can think of the Force, bringing balance to the Force, that is a Gnostic concept. And one of the things that, <clears throat> I just spoke with Mal a couple of hours ago, and one of the one of the accusations that is apparently made about the Jesuits, now this is an odd topic, but kind of on <clears throat> off topic, but on topic, is that apparently the Jesuits are supposed to have created the, the claim that the ends justify the means, right? And... So apparently there was a situation where, where some Jesuits said, okay, look, that's, that's a nice claim, but let's see the evidence now. And apparently that has not been forthcoming. But this concept, so this Sharani, to, to balance and harmonize the four schools within Islam, he created six rules. <clears throat> These are the first four rules here. And the first rule is the aims are more important than the means. In other words, the ends <clears throat> justify the means. This is a Muslim pillar of the Sharia. And then of course, number four, right, they call it al maqasid al wa al Sa'id, right? And then this one, necessities permit the forbidden. So the aims are more important than the means and necessities permit the forbidden. So this allows, obviously, this allows deceit and it, it means that there is no moral absolute in Islam. None. So that is incredibly, this is an incredibly toxic, corrosive idea 
within Islam that they are able then to do whatever they need. And this is no different to what communists do. This is this is subversive, incredibly subversive. Your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. It speaks for itself. You've highlighted the two important points. Uh, the aims are more important than the means, which means it's, it's an end game strategy. That's all it is. It's an end game strategy. And how we have to implement that to get to our end game, we will use by any means necessary, as Malcolm X would put it. Yeah. I and mean, century since Islam is only one fundamental rule. Anything goes. And that's exactly what it says. And then I wanted to, and then the next topic that we had discussed is to introduce this idea don't have to do everything today, but just to introduce people to, to this concept of dawah, right? And the fact that there are some very sophisticated dawah books and Muslims do go on dawah training. Uh, one concern that we see today is that the Muslim dawah to promote Palestine, to promote the, the war in Palestine, to, to undermine the, 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 well, to undermine Israel with propaganda is extremely good, extremely successful extremely well thought out and very heavily supported by Muslims. So one point I'll make here is that there was a time Muslims would say that those terrorists don't speak for Islam. Those terrorists are a small minority. Now we see that support for terrorism and support for terror groups is mainstream Islam. It is the common view. It is the majority view. It is the standard view. It's simply because now they have the political strength now that they are uppermost, they no longer have to pretend to be weak. That it is now clear, undeniable, that Muslims, in the overwhelming majority, support terrorism. Would you agree with that, Thunderous? Absolutely, and I think the strategy has changed as well. Certainly, from my um, experience of growing up in the Islamic uh, atmosphere, into the way that uh, Islam is um, doing their dawah now. For instance, Islam in say the 80s and 90s with people like um 70s 80s and 90s with people like Ahmed Didat and such they would be able they would be able to create tracks and things um and not necessarily mention too much about Islam say all the nice things that they considered were in Islam because there was the the the, the bulk of people within Europe and particularly England at the time were pretty ignorant as to what the contents of the Quran were nobody at home would have had a copy of the Quran let's let them go down to the library yeah. to get a copy um, or the Hadith. So these were very unfamiliar things as far as um, uh, the household was concerned in Europe at the time. So Islam could pretty much talk with immunity and impunity because there was no one there to challenge it. Then along came the 90s and the mid-90s and the internet uh, came about. And what happened is Islam started to get manifest on um, the internet. There were, there were uh, web pages and YouTube channels, so on and so forth, social media platforms. So this, so you could, they couldn't hide behind ignorance anymore. People were now having their own access to Islam, uh, the Islamic sources, as well as history. So people got more curious and finding out that the Muslims were lying about the contents of their own ideology and the contents of their um, sources. Right. You and just mentioned so now. That, yeah, so go on, go on, finish. Yeah. And so the, now they've had to change their tact as um, one of what well, not as offensive but more as a defensive by not so much controlling the narrative with um, people that they were speaking to like the non-muslim they're now more controlling the narrative within the islamic community themselves yeah you mentioned Ahmad didat and that's a very good point he's a fellow south african and he wrote here this book the combat kit against bible thumpers you can search in my archive for Combat Kit, link to the archive in the I've description. I've not seen that before. Wow. Okay, well, let's have a quick look at it. So for everyone who doesn't know, so I want to discuss Dawah. So for the for the rest of the episode, I, I guess one of the topics I want to really cover is Dawah to introduce everyone. And week by week, we'll have this discussion on Dawah and Dawah methods from Islam because I need to do I need to talk about Islam more. Um, combat Kit against Bible Thumpers. Bible Thumpers being Christians like Jehovah's Witnesses who harass Muslims in their own homes. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses Harass. are not Christians. They are, <laughs> according to Orthodox Christianity, no, they are not, by Ahmad Dira. So let's have a look at what he says here. Okay, so he brings instructions. There's instructions, and this is the index to the combat kit. It is a very short book. It's only 35 pages, and he mentions Arabs in Arabia, absurdities in the book of God, okay, alcohol, a devilish advice, apostasy, bastard, circumcision, and so on, David, God, qualities ill-befitting God. God with a small g, God's contradictory attributes, okay? <clears throat> God is not a fabricator of confusion. Paul, full of cunning and guile, okay? 
sons of God. God has them by the tons, okay? Tons of sons, as you would say. But let's have a look. How to use the combat kit? He gives instructions, right? Incest between mother and son. Now, that's, now often he will have a quote and he'll just say, he'll, all he'll say is incest between mother and son and a verse number. Now, what he's implying is that the Bible is teaching, it is instructing, whereas the Bible is description, not prescription. It is history, not a, ser not a series of commands, right? It is also history. So it is simply, it's an example of infidelity. It's an example of sin. It's an example of wrong. So let's have a look here. Um, let me pick up, for instance, now this is the actual page. He does not go into detail. He does not describe. I'll give you an example. This is the entire detail. There is no further evidence. There is no further context. He says, for instance, to eat shit and drink piss. Please excuse my French, but that's what's on the page. Mm -hmm. To eat shit and drink piss. That's, and he says, 2 Kings 18.27 and Isaiah 36.12. Therefore, the Bible is disgusting. The Bible is horrible because look, look what it teaches. No. In these uh, stories, can, can I... yes, Thunder's go on. Can I just use an example of something, right? Go to Samson has sex with the whore in Gaza, right? I, I, I wasn't expecting this that you pulled up, and I've d done the research, but I'll have to go through my notes again. But the Samson has sex with the whore in Judges 16, one, that's a very easy answer, all right? It says he went inside and hid inside her tent or her place of dwelling. And then he left the um, the place of her dwelling, went up to was it the, the city of Philistia, um, Philistine and tore down the gates, okay? Now, had he had sex with the whore, like the Muslim is trying to pr pr um, portray, then God's spirit would not have been on Samson in order to accomplish what God's will was, which was tear down the gates and carry him some distance. So you can already see that if you look at the narrative, that Samson did not have sex with her. He hid in her house as a place of, like the, the like the two spies that went into Rahab's house, right. okay, right. and then uh, they stayed there, and then she let them out by the window. Now, because the, 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 no one would assume that these two men, you know, sort of like did a spit roast with Rahab. No yeah. one's assuming that, but the mind well, of the Muslim well, does do that. Well, let me let me re just mention this then. <clears throat> Here, where he says this, okay, and also dung on your faces, and also he goes on to say, to eat cake with shit, he provides no context. He just says this mm, as a means exactly. to, as a means to somehow insult the Bible. But this is a story about the Jews are attacked in their city. They are surrounded. They are losing this war. They are losing this battle, and they are running out of food. And then the leader of the of the army that is killing them, that is that is that is currently um, oppressing them, right, in, in the siege, tells them, I am going to make sure that you will have no food and you will be left with the only option is to eat your own poop and drink your own pee, right? So he completely leaves out any context. There is no further context. This is the only content here. There is not, he explains nothing. So basically he's saying that God is teaching Christians to eat shit and drink piss. That's literally what he says. That's his language. Instead of saying that an enemy was insulting them after starving them to near death. And he tells them, I'm going to leave you in the position where you will have nothing other than to eat poop and drink pee. So this is incredibly dishonest. And one, thank you very much. Um, I, I really appreciate, hold on. That is from Optimus Princeps. Interesting, Optimus Princeps. Thank you. He says, I heard some of that Muhammad never even existed. Um, yeah, there, there's, it's really difficult to trace an actual historical Muhammad. There may have been multiple Muhammads, or he might be he might be a composite of numerous people. There may have been different Muhammads at different times, but the Muhammad as we know him today seems to be some kind of composite. Uh, your, your thoughts on that, Thunderous? Well, and about Muhammad's existence? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Whenever I hear about evidence about Muhammad's existence, I tend to be swayed with that. And when I hear people talk about Muhammad being a composite, I'm persuaded with that. When I hear Muhammad may have never existed and it was just an invention, I'm persuaded with that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't have a definitive um, opinion on my own. I just find that, if anything, it's, it's a damning indictment of Islam that Muhammad, who came several hundred years after Jesus, has no evidence unless you use circular reasoning. And that yeah. is the Quran and the Hadith is the only evidence that you have for him. Yeah. 
Yep. So, so this guy, so download this book. Um, it is in my Google archive. Uh, you will be able to find it in the description box. Just go to my Google archive and just look up combat kit, right? Or DDAT. And you're going to find this. And this was, this was one of the very earliest books. And there are videos of him on the internet where he's teaching classes, teaching people how to use this material. Now, of course, um, as you can see, this book is very basic, but he would give a long class on teaching people how to use this as polemics. And then, of course, now times have changed. We have much more sophisticated, shall we say, polemics in place. And one of the things that Thunderous and I mentioned a couple of weeks back was this book called Version 2 in Defense of Islam or In Defense of Islam Version 2, right? This is linked in the description box and you can find it in the archive. This is an informal refutation and master list for almost all mainstream misconceptions about Islam and lies propagated against it. Now, just, think, just, yes. So just go because as we were discussing before the show, when, when you have to, people have to sort of like learn to um, read lines and then just make out what what is the implication of the statements? For it says there, uh, this is an informal refutation and master list for almost all. Well, if it's a master list, it should be for all. If, if it's only yeah. for almost all, then it's not a master list, is it? That's Mainstream true. misconceptions, fine, it's true. There are Islamic conception, misconceptions out there about its lies and the Islam and lies propagated against it. So if you go back to that, um, um, Lloyd. Just give me one second. Um, Century Sin says, Didat was annoyed that it didn't specify camel urine. That's what you're supposed to be drinking. Yeah, I can see yeah, YouTube's not going to be happy with this video. Yes, go on. So it says that, and lies propagated against it. So I'm going to ask the audience, Islam lies to defend Islam. Muslims lie to defend Islam because when your premise is a lie, all that you can do is lie to defend it. And I think one of the most common comments in, um, in the comment section is, without lies, Islam dies. I'm going to ask the audience now, can anybody think of a lie by a non-Muslim propagated against Islam? Name no. your lie. No, they'll tell you, they'll call you a liar for quoting the hadith verbatim. Yes. So what you'll find is this book is actually deceptive, deceptive, is, is a deceit right from the start because there have, there's never been any lies propagated against it. There have all been quotations from the Quran and hadith to expose it, which is a damning right. indictment right. in itself. Yeah. So they say here, before you read this book, right? Uh, the instructions. So read this book before you read anything else. Highlight. They want to highlight the most mainstream attacks against Islam and refute them informally. Right? And then they want to defend this beautiful religion and share this book everywhere. In return, we will all earn rewards. So I want you to understand these people are very, very organized. They are very serious. We don't do this. They have people that do this, that are paid, that go on duty. I've had, I've had apologists, these Muslim apologists tell me, I am now on duty. I will answer your questions. They go to rooms that are set up in Pakistan, in India and various places, and they go online and that's their job. They leave, they come out of school, they come out of university and off they go. They do classes, they yeah. do training classes for this. Can you just go back up there, back up to yeah. where the yellow way, the yellow way you just marks them? Because yeah. there was a couple of points I found. It says there, share this book everywhere. In return, we will earn rewards. Yes. You notice it's not the person that's using the book, but if the person using the book and the one who published the book, they're both going to get rewards, which is interesting. Then you look at the list there. This book assumes the following. You have a strong knowledge of Islam before and believe in it well. You recognize the argument from key words about only. It is, I won't be posting them. And notice the third point, that if you are still new to religion or not that strong in faith, you should not be reading the non-Muslim arguments until you learn thoroughly about Islam. What do you think that means, uh, Lloyd? And do you think that Allah has also made the same suggestion in the Quran? No, tell me what you're thinking first. Tell me Go what you're to um, Al-Ma'idah, Al chapter 5, verses, verses 101 and 102. So it's Al-Ma'idah, which is book 5 of the, um, chapter 5 of the Quran, and verses 101 to 102. is or you who believe do not ask about things which if they are shown to you will distress you but if you ask about them while the quran is being revealed they will be shown to you yeah so do not ask about things which if they're shown to you will 
distress you. will distress you. So already Muhammad is speaking to his own audience, right? Yes. Saying things are going to be distressing, but don't ask me questions. It's almost like I need to fabricate the answers first. Yep. And then here, yep. of course, uh, a people ask such questions before you and they thereby became disbelievers. Disbelievers. Yeah, I thought you might go here. <laughs> I thought you might bring this up. Yeah. So yeah. So don't ask questions. Or now they actually do mention. They actually do mention in this book that if you ask questions, you may that that, that apostasy is tied to the wrong knowledge. Okay. That apostasy is tied to the wrong knowledge. Now they say, for instance, how to use Google Cache and how to use the archive.org to find information. Right? So they actually are teaching people how to do that. This is why when you look at Muslims, they, they copy and paste because they do tell you copy paste from here, from inside this book and copy paste from the sources that we're going to give you. They then show how to use the archive links. They mention archive.org, how to download YouTube videos in case they get removed. They teach people to do that. <clears throat> they then have like the basics of Islam, proving the essentials, pages 22 to 25. Refutations, proving the preservation of the Quran. Um, actually, you know what I need to do about... Uh, okay, wait. Slight, slight... My favorite, my favorite human, Martin Luther. Let me just briefly tell you a story. So Martin Luther has a series of... Okay, hold on. Uh, Martin Luther has a, has a well-known series of works that were recorded by his very faithful students that are now... Um, disparaged by people because they're too embarrassing. They, these are called the table talks of Martin Luther. Okay, now before these were called table talks, they were called the divine discourses. Now the divine discourses were lost; they were burned, but one copy miraculously survived. It was found buried under his house, and a faithful student of Martin Luther recovered it and was able to reprint it and put it out in the world, praise be to Allah. And they found this book perfectly preserved, right? So Martin Luther's divine discourses were perfectly preserved. Now, one day I'll talk about this. I'll show you guys the references. We'll go through the table talk. Sorry, no, no. The divine discourses of Martin Luther that were perfectly preserved. We'll discuss it one day. I just thought it's interesting to the, the, the parallel. And so basically, the table talks are, to all intents and purposes, the hadiths of Martin Luther. <clears throat> anyway, Thunderous, but back to you. So on to this, this topic. Yeah, so um, proving... So, oh, I forgot where, you, where we were. So proving the preservation of the Quran. So what, what the, you'll find with Muslims in this as well, and this is from my experience, not my personal experience, but what I've seen, and I think many people in the audience um, are going to uh, possibly agree with this, and that is a Muslim will more likely read this than they will the Quran. This is the education tool for how point, Muslims... Yes. They will more likely read this than the Quran. This will be the, the basis and the source of their Islamic faith. It is not a justification of why to believe the Quran or, or why to believe the Hadith or why to believe Muhammad. Their faith is predicated on the arguments against other religions. So this is the teaching tool of how to keep people in Islam rather than the Quran and Hadith. Yeah, they actually, so they actually have a nice long list of the kind of arguments, things to do. Arguments of Christian evangelists against Islam for Christianity and criticism of other faiths and ideologies, right? And then they speak of, uh, like hadiths, for instance, these are the polemic tactics, okay? People will take a single verse or hadith in isolation, which is not true. Even if you give them the entire context, they'll simply state that's a weak hadith or they'll state that that's wrong. So they'll deny everything anyway. And that's right. and what you've just shown in that Ahmed Didat um, book earlier on. That's exactly what he's done. So you notice the hypocrisy and the duplicity in the nature of Islamic Dawa Gandhists. Yeah. They do exactly the same thing that they, they 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 claim they don't do themselves. Yeah, and it says if they ignore the fact that not all hadiths are authentic. In fact, some are termed as weak and some even as fabrication. Now, the odd fact that they forget here is that in the Sharia, it states that the Sharia explicitly quotes weak hadith as valid because a weak hadith mm -hmm. that quotes Muhammad is considered authentic. So weak hadith are actually authentic. And also, hadiths that are classified by one scholar as weak might be classified as sahih by another. 
what is fabricated according to one scholar might be sahih according to another. And so these hadiths are all considered of value. And in fact, they have a grading scale, as I've mentioned in the past. Right. So, Thunders, your thoughts, your thoughts on that? No, absolutely. Absolutely. So it, it, this goes into another argument that I've got with Dawagantis like this, where Muhammad said that there's going to be 73 sects, 72 of them are fake and only one of them is real. So when you're looking at um, an instruction manual like this, how do you know, you know, from the person that's reciting this, if this is from the one of the 73 that's going to con be condemned or the one that's from the true Islam that Allah is going to bless? Yeah. And... Or is it, or is it a one for all? Is it a one for all instruction manual for all Muslim sects? No idea. I mean, it's all, yeah. Oh, by the way, exactly. this, this one. Now they come up. Now they mention this book. So if you guys are interested in looking at Islamic Dawah, they also mention this book: Misconceptions and Refutations, the Sabigat. So just look up the Sabigat by Ahmad Yusuf Al Sayyid. Right, this one is very interesting because this is now a much more sophisticated deep book. <clears throat> Misconceptions and refutations, Sabigat. Right, let's have a look here. They've got features and effectiveness of the contemporary onslaught against Islam, contemporary misconceptions, how people are influenced, how to deal with this, rules for dealing with entertained misconceptions, and for instance, the rules of debate with holders of misconceptions. Let's go have a look at that. The first rule prior to debate, review of the attitude of the other party and their available visual and written material. One important factor of success in debating with people who, have, who raise misconceptions is to have prior knowledge of their views, the fundamentals they rely on, and more importantly, the evidence they cite. This will help in preparing our answers and ensure that we are not surprised by something that we find difficult to address on the spot. Okay, this may make one appear in a weak position despite being right. None appreciates the importance of this rule better than those who have argued with such people. Okay, so they've got rules for how they conduct things. Right, they've got very fair, very detailed rules for how they will conduct things. So you need to know your enemy because they have studied you. They have a plan for dealing with you. Do you have a plan for dealing with them? Uh, with you, Thunderous. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So, I mean, this is something before we came on air, we were talking about martial arts. Um, and blocking defensive techniques. But another um, point that I thought about as well is that when you go into a martial art tournament, or maybe when a boxer is going to go and have a fight with another boxer, um, what they'll do is they'll study that boxer as many fights as they can to work out, well, why did he win that fight? Why did he lose? Is he prone to cuts? Is he prone to sort of like gassing out earlier on in, in the earlier on? Does he spend most of his, uh, say, um, energies in the first two or three rounds, then gets tired in the latter rounds? So there are there are techniques, and this is the same sort of technique um, that they're using as a strategy. Because from from a Muslim point of view, it is war. It's just a war of words. No, Christians are supposed to win over minds and hearts. We're not in a war. We're not there to win arguments. We're there to win hearts and be reasonable. But not to the Muslim. This is a battle of attrition, and they're having to use dawah like this because they're in a non-Muslim world. So they have to use it on in terms that is beneficial for them, that doesn't bring reproach on their their God's name or their, their ideology. Yeah. Because Someone, if you're living in a Muslim land, if you're living in a Muslim land, the tactics will be completely different, as people in, in, that can watch the news can see for themselves. Yeah. Someone asked about uh, the word matruk. Look, I recommend also have a look to this book, An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran by Yasser Qadi. Again, have a look. Right, Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran. It's in my archive. Have a look at this. This book is going to be very interesting. It will educate you a great deal in dealing with issues of dawah. Right? And they speak here of, for instance, Mantuk and Mafhum. Right? Just to mention <clears throat> Rotom Electric. Thank you very much. Now, for instance, everyone knows about abrogation, but you don't know about Mantuk and Mafhum. So, for instance, this is where. This is what is written on the page versus how that is understood. So it might say on the page that Allah likes boiled eggs. Okay? That's the mantuk. That is the actual literal wording on the page. The mafhum is how it is understood, how they what they believe it actually means. Allah likes boiled eggs means Allah likes chicken, semi-raw, 
with a slice of garlic and the sky is purple right that's what the that's how the verse is actually interpreted by the scholars even though it says the sky even though it says allah likes a boiled egg in the morning it's interpreted as allah likes a chicken leg half raw and the sky is purple that's what it actually is understood to mean that's the difference between mantuk and mafhum there are some crazy ideas within islam that you do need to understand okay like peshat and remez in the talmud very similar idea yeah. <clears throat> okay and here he speaks about abrogation which is something that muslims will deny whole day every day yeah this is the holes in the narrative guy uh any thoughts from you thunders no 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 thoughts no thoughts okay so let me just continue here with some of this so just to show you um they actually do speak of that if you ask questions it can lead to um apostasy there is that um oh they also often will utilize islamqa.info now whenever i quote from it i'm wrong but for some reason they are able to quote from islam qa when it's convenient for them but they don't allow the same uh, the same you know rule to be valid for for you as someone who's discussing with them so what is islam they have all these questions right with links who is allah who is the prophet muhammad right that they they mention this is why they can get all of these things and copy paste stuff for new muslims right things how to defend for new muslims let's continue here and the multiverse hypothesis so it's not just about islam they also are forcing a particular scientific moral and social worldview so understand they're not just coming after your religion they're coming after your form of law they're coming after your science your educational system because they want you to believe that the world is exactly as allah says it is your thoughts on that thunderous well the, uh, it's interesting that ali dawa would turn and say that we have to get away from the sciences um and the science in the quran and here we are talking about the multiverse i mean it's not even a relevance is it to the to the discussion you're there to, to the whole point of dawa um is to to reason with people that the hadith and the quran one from Muhammad, one from Allah, and this is the truth. It's a continuation of um, the Judeo-Christian narrative, which we know it isn't. But that's that's the logical point of what um, Dawa is. That's the end game. However, th these sort of things are just nothing more than serve distractions, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm just trying to think who who is the guy that wrote the <clears throat> the best commentary on Bukhari. Uh, who was the guy that wrote the most famous commentary on Sahih Bukhari? Uh, Do you remember what that was? There's something that I'm trying to think because it's got the rules on the. Um... No, mate, I don't. It'll come to me in a moment. Oh, the Fat Al Bari. Yes, the whole one. Um... <clears throat> okay, just I wanted to show people quickly since, since this has come up. Uh, I'll look up Matruk in a second, but just so that people understand, since since the <clears throat> idea was to talk about how Muslims will lie to you, okay, and about hadiths, <clears throat> because this book that we've just covered mentions that that you know we have a misunderstanding about the about my hadiths being weak and all that kind of stuff, and therefore they use this to train Muslims. So do understand that these people who teach Dawa. We teach Muslims to defend Islam also lying to those Muslims. So they are teaching them false knowledge so that and these Muslims are then spreading false knowledge. So let's have a look here. This is the Fat al Bari. The Fat al Bari is <clears throat> um, a book that's written by a very, very famous Muslim scholar, which is the most famous commentary on the Sahih Bukhari. So this book is even considered more important than the Sahih Bukhari because it provides additional context. So it is it is something that the scholars of Islam will turn to more than they will turn directly to the to the Sahih themselves, right? And they say here now this was a collaboration recently between the students at Medina University, which is the home of Muhammad, <coughs> and also that of um, Al Azhar, the most famous Islamic university in the world. And they said here removing weak hadiths from works was not the example of the scholars otherwise imam ibn hajar al askalani would not have included them himself in the fat al bari so the greatest commentary on the works of sahih bukhari includes weak hadith 
So weak hadith are used in su to support opinions because a weak hadith containing the words of the Prophet is preferred over pure opinion and personal reasoning. This is the example set by all the scholars, including Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari used them deliberately in his work Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. So we all know about the Sahih Bukhari. What they don't, what you, what you don't know about is that Bukhari wrote other works like the Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, which do not contain just the Sahih, because the Sahih Bukhari is the Sahih alone. The Sahih of Imam Bukhari is a collection of the Sahih Hadith specifically. It is not a collection of the only Hadith that scholars should use. The scholars themselves state a Sahih Hadith has a 99 to 100% chance of being entirely accurate. That is the rating of Sahih, 99 to 100% correct. A Hassan Hadith has 85 to 99% chance of being entirely accurate. A Da'if Hadith has about a 45 to 85% chance of being entirely accurate. This is the widest band of accuracy. Even a fabricated Hadith has up to a 45% chance of being accurate, since the grading it was given may have been wrong, or the fabricator may have spoken the truth in this instance. Weak Hadith should not be treated like fabricated Hadith, because an 85% chance of being entirely accurate is a very high chance. If you received 85% on your test scores, would you throw that out saying that isn't worth anything? Each hadith is treated individually. There is no such thing in Islam as banning an entire grade of hadiths from being used. Even fabricated hadith are still studied because one scholar may grade it fabricated, while another may grade it sahih, and there are many famous examples among the scholars of this occurring. Over to you, Thunderous. Well, I was just thinking as you're reading that, that you could even quote that in front of a Muslim and all they would turn and say, well, that's his opinion. Now, you and I know better. Yes. The audience know better. Yeah. But all you, I always look at it from what's the worst case scenario when you're talking to a Muslim. And they would just turn and say, well, that's just his opinion. That's not my opinion. I don't share his opinion. And we've actually seen demonstrations of this with so-called Muslim scholars in high, uh, not, yeah, um, Speaker's Corner, um, where scholars have actually been quoted. And people have said, well, I don't recognize that scholar. I don't accept that scholar. That scholar yes. was wrong because because it goes against the narrative of the discussion that's being discussed at the time where, my, where Islam is being exposed over a particular particular top, topic. Now, you and I, the audience know better. They can't get away from this. However, when you're looking at Turkiya, right, and uh, lying in order to propagate Islam, they they know that they can lie justly to propagate Islam in the face of um, scholarly works like this, where it challenges the narrative. Yeah, and you can also go to the Reliance of the Traveler, of course, which will tell you as much about Hadith as well. Do you have any thoughts you want to add before I go, just because I just want to look up the, the references of Hadiths. Um, oh, here, for instance, this is from the Reliance of the Traveler. This is the most popular, the most famous um, Sunni Sharia manual in the world. Now, Muslims will say, well, it's not because there are others and every time I ask them, so if not this one, then which one, please? And they can never tell me, which is really strange. So they say here, seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. And they tell you the meaning of this hadith, though the hadith itself is not well authenticated. In other words, being weak, it is true. Mm. That's in the Sharia. This is indisputable. So, yeah, Muslims are lying to you and they, they've been lied to themselves and they, they are just lying for the sake of defending Islam, which is insane. I, th I, th I think another as well, you've got to look at the human being trait as well. Um, when you're speaking to, say, something like a Darwinian evolutionist or an atheist or whoever who doesn't accept the biblical narrative, and even some that do accept the biblical narrative, when you're challenging them on something, their first inclination when you're um, telling them you got this wrong, here's an evidence, is, is denial. It's just a human being trait. So yeah. some human beings, as as a natural default, may not intentionally um, lie. It's just a natural default to human beings who are embarrassed when they're being caught out for not knowing what they're talking about. Yeah, I wonder there's, um, I wonder if I should get anything else in this. But um, Does anyone have any questions? Do you guys have questions about Islamic polemics, Islamic dawah, and so on? Because that'll be interesting. Just to maybe take some questions. <clears throat> Notice, scholars disagree about the Quranic verses and hadiths that deal with the attributes of Allah, such as his hand. They don't know whether it's literal or figurative, which is called the tawil. 
right? So there are, there are many, many questions about that. And yes, sir. yeah, his hand is his two right hands. They don't know if it's literal or figurative yet, do yeah, they? But does, I mean, it, does it mean that Allah, when they say two right hands, does he mean that two right hands? They, they see now the reference here may refer to, for instance, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the two right hands of God. Right as in correct, as in righteous, as in holy. So there's the question that, that, that exists. Is this a reference to the Trinity? And Allah has two righteous, two holy hands, meaning a Trinity. Or it, mm. does Allah have two right hands, in which case he has a deformity? Your thoughts, uh, you can, you can, you can, you can infer anything that you need to, because if you go back to uh, what Yasser Qadi said, where you can um, interpret, where he said that the words can mean things. So if it says a boil, uh, Allah has an egg for in the, in the morning, then you can infer what you need to do. Is it scrambled? Is it boiled? Is it um, um, an omelet? Um, yeah. Is it raw? So you can take what any inference that you want from that small statement, and it's the yeah. same thing that you're saying. If it says Allah has two right hands, then you can take what, any inference that you want from there, because there is no, if you like, um, categorical, here's the actual, whether it's figurative or literal in this. I think it's one of those examples that serves a purpose at the time, predicated on the audience that you're speaking to at the time. Yeah, but it's legal for them to lie. And notice, yeah. scholarly consensus is legally binding, right? And um, and then there's mention there's there's plenty to talk about on the scholars, but uh, and so have a look here. The surahs, okay. <clears throat> so when we've arrived at all the rulings of the so the scholars have arrived at the rulings of sacred law through evidence that is either unquestionably established transmission or probabilistically established. So the surahs of the Quran, all of its verses, and those hadiths which have reached us by so many channels of transmission, that belief in them is obligatory, right? All are of unquestionably established transmission. So it's interesting that they'll start denying hadiths that are sahih when these are considered obligatory to believe in. Because <clears throat> they say it is impossible that the various channels could all have conspired to fabricate them. So then you'll say, well, Sahih then means obligatory to believe in. But of course, Aisha was never six years old when she got married. Somehow, suddenly, Sahih Bukhari is wrong. So the Muslims will lie to you whole day, every day. And there was a question. Your thoughts on this before I go to the question here? No, I was just actually, no, I don't mean to be rude, but I was actually reading the question by uh, Wally Ram. Um, while you were actually saying that, that was the one. Uh, uh, question, are there Muslim critiques of modern politics and culture that use the Quran as the core of the critique? Um, that's a good question, to be fair. I'm just trying, I was just trying to okay, think of well, something. Okay, well, let's have a look at this, okay? Let's, let's have a look at this. This might be interesting. Uh, this is the electronic version of, we are pleased to offer this electronic version, and I'll just do this one as well. Let me just bring up the review. Let's go back here. This is the Quranic concept of war by General S. K. Malik, right? The Quranic concept of war. So <clears throat> now S. K. Malik, if I recall, was the president of Pakistan. Or we will get into it. We'll just read through this. So according to the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, the Quran is a manual for warfare. Just like Sun Tzu has the art of war, <clears throat> Muhammad's Quran is an equivalent to Sun Tzu's art of war. So we're making this available because of its critical significance in the ideological foundations of the international jihad movement and the unapologetic rationale it offers for the use of terrorism to accomplish political and religious ends. Okay. So now they speak of equal as important for the jihad advanced by Brigadier S.K. Malik in this book are the foreword by Muhammad Zia ul Haq, sorry, the late president of Pakistan. So, so Brigadier General S. K. Malik wrote the book, The Quranic Concept of War. No one went and said, but the sorry, but the Quran and Islam, it's a religion of peace, and the Quran is about peace, Mr. Malik. How can you compare it to Sun Tzu's The Art of War and, and as a book that teaches jihad? So the president of Pakistan, right, and also the army chief of staff, and then 
wrote a forward for it and the preface by Allah Buksh K. Brohi, the late Advocate General of Pakistan. Their endorsements of the book established Malik's views on jihad as national policy, as Pakistani policy, and they gave his interpretation official state sanction. So, General Zia embraces Malik's understanding of jihad as a duty extending to individual citizens as well as soldiers. And Brohi drawing an explicit distinction between Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam, and the Dar al-Harb, the house of mm. war. In other words, where you live. Your thoughts on that, Thunderous? No, absolutely. I was just trying to find a Quranic reference that sort of backs up um, the comments that are in there, because I think that was the point that the uh, the question was asked. Is there any Quranic references that Muslims will use in the Quran to justify their actions? Yeah. And I think, personally speaking, I can't think of anything that's in the Quran. I think most of the political ideology that, that Islam uses actually comes from the Hadith yeah, and although, the interpretations thereafter. Not fair enough. Sheikh Buyardi says, too bad that Pakistan thinks that the Quran is about warfare as Pakistan couldn't fight its way out of a paper bag. Look, true on one level. I can tell you stories. For instance, when we were training, I was training some, I was training some chopper pilots, attack chopper pilots. We, we installed a new camera system on their choppers. They, these are guys from Saudi. The problem they had was when they were doing low-level flights at night or even during the daytime or bad weather, um, there was the risk of them fouling the rotors on power cables, right? C cables that were strung. So they, they had incidents like this where they would be flying low, doing training or doing attack missions, and the, the, the choppers would foul on wires, cables. So we gave them a new system that would actually, the, the new camera system was could at four kilometers, we could actually detect wires that were strung up like own poles, electric cables, whatever, even deliberate cables designed to, to, to foul these, these choppers' um, uh, blades. So what I learned from the pilots, I had a French and I believe I had an American or German pilot that were teaching these guys. And they were telling me that because of inbreeding amongst the Arabs, they have very bad eyesight. And they said, these guys are terrible pilots. At the end of the day, it's going to be foreigners that are going to be doing the, the, the bulk of the heavy lifting, the attack missions and so on, right? That aside... Something that you'll know from, from gangbangers, that if you cannot face someone in a face-to-face -face battle, what a gangbanger will do is wait in a dark alley, in a corner, for you to walk past, and he will shoot you in the back. And that is what they are doing, because they know they cannot beat you in a stand-up fight. So they will knife you in the back. You understand? Metaphorically, that's what they are doing. So you are looking for an enemy in front of you that is never going to come. You need to be searching in the shadows. <clears throat> Your thoughts on us? Oh, absolutely. And you see that with the way that they attack apostates. But in the Western world, when you consider your comments from a couple of months ago about how Islam is funded, they if they can't use uh, physical violence and war, they will use political um, political ideologies and um, hate speech laws and such in order to, to advance their agenda. Yeah. And by the way, this book was mandatory reading in the Pakistani army. Uh, does that answer your question, Wally? Does that answer your question? Um, I think, I think Wally, with Wally's question, it says... Um, oh, sorry, yeah, that, uh, Actually, no, that, maybe Muslim? I didn't answer the question. Are there Muslim critiques of modern politics that use the Quran as the core of the critique? Yes, they are, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but I... But, I mean, I just anything, couldn't think yeah. of any. I think most of them come from the Hadith. Wally, my opinion is most of them come from the Hadith. I can't think of anything that comes from the Quran off the top of my head. I think certain moral values, they may say, like, for instance, we don't eat pork or we don't drink wine, these sorts of things might be used. But from um, a political point of view, I can't think of anything that comes from the Quran. Um, yeah, so do me a favor, rephrase the question, will you, Wally? Because yes, there are. I just need to try and think what it is. But um, for some reason, ah, there's a password on this. No wonder I can't. So w someone's asking, Rotom Electric says, what is the name of that book? The Quranic Concept of War. It is in my archive. Have a look there. The Quranic Concept of War. It is mandatory reading in the Pakistani army, right? And um, it is relatively unknown in Western circles, but this is the Muslim version of... So, critical themes of Malik's work is that of just war, or jihad in Islam, is inherently spiritual warfare, religious warfare. So yeah, he hasn't heard that Islam's religion of peace. And of course, they will strike terror into the hearts of Islam's enemies, right? And then also, you can just read the opening chapter of the of the... Um, the Constitution of the Republic of, of Iran, which, which explicitly states they will export the jihad globally 
and they state further in the document that they will work with revolutionary organizations around the world, arming them, training them, collaborating with them to further the destabilization of the West and to also push the Islamic revolution worldwide and make sure that every country looks like Iran, basically. Any thoughts, Lenners? No, I think we've come to the end of the show for tonight, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, so guys, hopefully that, it's just, uh, yeah, we wanted to just catch up with Thunderous. We did mention we would talk a little bit about um, Dawa. So hopefully this gives you some sources and references that you can use and look at. Uh, Wally says, to expand the question, do they ever directly critique democracy, republicanism, or any other Western system of government or basic critique on the Quran? Yes, they do. Um, I can't think offhand of the book uh, or various. There's, there'll be numerous of them. Um, but you need to read stuff by, like, um, let me see if I have it. Uh, you can read anything by milestones. Ah, uh, oh, good grief. There's plenty of those. There's, like, milestones. Um, anything by ISIS, man. Anything by ISIS will do. Anything by Al-Qaeda. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the Muslim scholar milestones plus Said Qutb. Um, you can have a look at this. There's numerous of these here. Um, just bring this up. Like Milestones by Sayyid Qutb. You can have a look at these books like this. Um, so they they will talk about that. These are critiques. So there are books like this. There are numerous of them. I can't think offhand. But you will certainly, certainly find numerous of these um, available to you. Um, if you drop the question in the chat later, I can try and look up some sources I might have. But I'm going to have various sources in my... But their entire politics, the entire um, foreign policy of Islam is based on the Quran. And thank you very much, Sheikh Biardi. Thank you very much, says to one of my favorite content makers. Thank you very much. Yeah, lost word thunder is to you. No, I'd just like to say, um, no, I've, I've gone to say, um, other than in, in the future, I think people need to watch what they're saying now moving forward. If their law that's in Scotland gets enacted in other countries, and I'm of the opinion that it will do, I think now's the time to start practicing what we say and how we say it when we're being critical of um, something that goes against the biblical narrative. Yeah. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Sheikh Biadi. I, I really do appreciate that. So guys, yeah, thank you. Um, on Tuesday, I will of course be doing a talk on, um, let me just go there. Tuesday, I'll be doing a talk on Luther. Let me just bring that back up, if I may. Um, where am I? <clears throat> Let's go live. So this will be my talk on Tuesday. Uh, Luther, right? So. Luther, Hitler, and Muhammad, a common hatred of Jews. And there's going to be some really, I'm going to expand upon the material that I've, that I've been presenting, but there is a great deal of common overlap between Luther, Hitler, and Muhammad. Now, what, what I do find interesting is that there are numerous comments that came in. I've, I've deleted those. I've banned those accounts. I, I do not tolerate that kind of thing. Um, that basically are endorsing Luther's views, which are no different to Muhammad's views and no different to Hitler's views. So these quote-unquote Christians are endorsing Hitler. They're endorsing Muhammad. I didn't realize that they was, those were great Christians and great Christian examples, but Martin Luther's views are no different to those of these two characters here. So, yeah, I just find it very, very disturbing that, and Martin Luther's views are taken as, as gospel truth, effectively, and the lies that he told are considered to now be fact. And he lied. He was a nasty propagandist. I mean, you have no idea the depths of depravity of this man in his hatred of Jews and his lies about Jews and the fact that he his words led to enormous amounts of oppression, murder, death, and and theft. And it's incredible how much damage he caused. And people are just just lapping it up as if it was candy. Okay. Um, last thought, Thunderist. Over to you. No, I've got. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for tuning in um, this evening and spending some time with Lloyd and myself. And to those that will be listening to the show later, thank you for taking the time to do so. And I'd like to thank you, Lloyd, for another um, interesting conversation uh, and the continuation of our discussions on the uh, discussions on the Sunday evening. You're hey, welcome. Thank you. So yeah, we'll see each other in two weeks. Next week is Easter. <clears throat> My throat is still killing me. Uh, next week's Easter, so guys, I, I wish you all a very, very happy and blessed Easter. Um, 
I hope you all have a, have a wonderful and safe season. You know, well, well a safe Eastern weekend, I meant to say. And um, yeah, and then I will see you in two weeks. And also in a couple of weeks, Mal and I will be doing a talk as well. We'll be discussing Martin Luther. And uh, yeah, I'll continue. And I'll see you guys on Tuesday evening because yeah, my, I need to give my throat a break. Thunderous, thanks again. It was always wonderful talking with you. And I'll see you in two weeks, Thunderous. All right. No doubt at all. See you soon, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Good night.